All right, everyone, good morning. My name is Leah Brown. I am the Assistant Director for Education here at Moton. And today with us, I'm super excited, we have Anita Giles Yay. of the Virginia Children's <laughs> Book Festival. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing all right. I remembered that my uh, one of my best friend's mothers always said we need to put some color on those lips. So here I am, got some. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, yeah. It's like frame the face, get ready. Yep. <laughs> Um, so I'm uh, Juanita Giles, and I'm the uh, director of the Virginia Children's Book Festival, and um, I will say that I'm so glad to be here this morning. Um, it's so weird to look at myself and not at you, but you know, that's the way these things work. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm so excited to be here because I will say that the Moden is just like our most treasured partner. We, the Moden and the book festival, I feel like we hardly take a step without, you know, being able to be like, oh, let's do this together. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited to be here today. Um, and I'm going to let uh, Leah ask me some questions. <laughs> okay. So our first question, what inspired you to begin the children's book festival? Oh gosh. Okay. Well, that's, that's sort of a, well, it's it's so long ago it's it's <laughs> hopefully we've changed some of this by now but i'll say that i am from the area i grew up here in farmville and uh, i did go away to school and you know uh so uh i was gone for quite a number of years i went away to college and graduate school and then i moved to georgia and did some other things but i eventually came home uh, and when i came home my home is in charlotte county i started volunteering at the children's library there and when this sounds like such a silly story, but anyway, so when you're there at the library working, you have a little uh, pad of paper and you tick off how many kids come in every day mm -hmm. um, just to sort of know how much traffic you're getting. And so there would be most days nobody came in mm -hmm. and I couldn't understand why. Um, and because I've always read, I mean, I just was a voracious reader growing up, uh, you know, one of those kids who got in trouble for sneaking a book under the table. Me too. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, you know, back when I could read in the car and not get car sick, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And uh, so always reading. So I just didn't understand um, why kids weren't coming to the library. So I started doing a little bit of investigating and I found that there were a whole lot of issues that were causing kids not to come to the library. Um, some of which were more um, being in a rural area, you know, there's mm -hmm. really no, no public transportation to the library. Um, you know, there were other activities going on. There's always so much sports and things for kids and things like that now. But as I dug deeper, uh, what I found was that Southside Virginia, the region where we are, the Moton and the Book Festival, mm -hmm. um, one in five adults is functionally illiterate here. And Southside has the um, lowest attainment rate of any region in the state, um, lowest uh, yeah, educational attainment rate, and also the highest poverty level. And all those things sort of coalesce into this mm -hmm. terrible problem um, for generations of children. And what when I say that, what I mean is very simply, if you don't come from a reading home, it's really hard to become a reader yourself. And that's not to diminish what teachers do in the classroom. Teachers work so hard, but they're, you know, they're working so hard on the mechanics of reading and, you know, so many subjects that um, reading for pleasure is really something that there's not a lot of time for, you know, in school, um, especially as kids get older. And more and uh, more and more data that I was looking at was showing me, you know, that parents, you know, sort of stop reading to their children mm. when they're when they can read themselves, which um, it seems it, it has been shown to be a real mistake. You know, kids want parents to keep reading to them. And it just it just was this huge sort of overwhelming um, situation. And I realized that it wasn't just here. You know, what seemed like it was a problem just for here wasn't. Um, just because you may have access to a library doesn't mean you go. There are all sorts mm -hmm. of things. And I thought, well, darn it, I, I, I don't like this at all. <laughs> I don't like this at all at all. I want kids to really um, love reading and become lifelong readers um, for its own sake. And also because being a reader is the thing that um, will make you more successful as a human being, no matter mm -hmm. what your economic background, your educational background, it doesn't even matter. It's being a reader 
um, that will make you the most successful in life. And so I thought, well, what can I do about this? And, you know, they're you know, I thought about working with schools and things like that. And they already have so many initiatives and they're trying so hard. And I thought, what can I offer them that's different that they don't have to manage? And I thought, well, I just, what if I made the greatest field trip any kid could possibly go on? What would be my ideal field trip? And so that's really how the book festival came uh, into being. I mean, I'd certainly never met any authors when I was growing up. And I thought, well, what if I could get these kids in a room with these authors and illustrators? What would it be to bring it to life for them? Mm -hmm. And so that was that was the start of the whole thing. <laughs> the greatest field trip ever. That yeah. was that was. The, yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, when you were talking, I'm like, yeah, reading is super important because it's like I've learned. Am I reading this to enjoy it or am I reading this to read it? Mm -hmm. Not the same. No, not the same. And then just like reading comprehension. Like I read this thing, but I don't know what I read. Right. Well, let's reread it and then like diagram it and see what actually is going on. So just it helps with perception of words yes. and meaning of words. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. And the thing, I mean, you know, if you, unless you grow up loving to read, mm -hmm. then the day will come when you don't, if you're saying, you know, like you're reading Beowulf or something like that, you know? You're just, you're not going to understand why you're reading it to begin with. Mm -hmm. You're not going to understand that it's a great story because you won't have that background of, you know, making yourself read something, even if it's difficult because the story is so great. And that's, you know, that's something that um, we've really found too. I mean, of course, we're not your typical literacy organization. Um, we don't teach kids to read or anything like that. What we do is we consider ourselves a readership organization where we want to, create an environment where kids want so badly to read mm -hmm. that they will read. And I mean, who among us hasn't found a book that, you know, maybe a little bit above our reading level, but it's just so good that you're mm -hmm. going to get through it. And that's, and that's really, you know, how we feel like we can encourage kids to, to move forward in their um, readership lives. You know, I mean, we mm -hmm. just, you know, when, when kids, it's so funny because when uh, we set up the book festival, we have recommendations for grade levels, you know, this is appropriate, but half the time it's crazy. I got to miss some water. Sorry. Pollen, yeah. pollen today. Happy spring. Yeah. Happy spring. Happy. <laughs> <coughs> but you know, kids who are really young will want to go to middle grade authors, even though it's above their level, just because they want to read about dragons. Yes. It doesn't matter if they're in the third grade, they're, they're going to read that sixth grade book. They're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And conversely, what's so fun is that uh, in 2019, actually, this was the last year we had the in-person festival. I passed a group of seventh graders and I said, where are y'all going? Who y'all going to go see? And they said, oh, we're going to see Todd Parr. And I said, Todd Parr. <laughs> I said, Todd writes, you know, for elementary school students, you know, even pre-readers. And they said, we've seen Todd Parr every year for the past six years. Oh, you're going to go back and see him. And I was like, oh, I love gosh, that. That's perfect. Isn't that the sweetest thing? <laughs> and Todd says the same thing. He'll be like, I've seen these kids. He's come every year, you know, and he's like, I've seen these kids grow up and these kids that, you know, came to see me when they were in the first grade, like they're in middle school and they stop and they see me and say hi and he recognizes them I mean it's just I wish I'd had that opportunity yeah. when I was grown up to just be like well I've known Todd Parr since I was in the first grade and he's my good friend and I get yeah. to see him here that I mean is, it's just oh. no it's just been great that's amazing <laughs> so way off track here oh that's part of like this, this is right. the best kind of best kind of interview we we, we are free-flowing I love like, it that's amazing because I'm seventh graders it's it's a it's a weird time in everybody's life. Mm -hmm. And it's yes. like, well, we still don't see Todd. I know. I know. And it's so, oh, wow. That's you know, awesome. Like his books, you know, it's okay to be different. You know I mean? You need that in the seventh grade. Yes. <laughs> you need it. <laughs> oh, and like the relationships that are being built. Yeah. I know. I know. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I love okay. it. Yeah. All right. Okay. I know you okay. have more questions. <laughs> Okay, so what was the process to even get started? Oh, golly. So I will say that, you know, so once it was an idea, 
um, I thought, well, I got to talk to some folks about this. And so my dear friend, Katie Snyder, um, who is in Lynchburg, um, had been working on the idea with me for a long time. And so we started talking to other folks. Um, we actually were fortunate enough to meet Meg Medina, who is an author in Richmond. She actually won the Newberry last year. Oh, nice. And so we met her um, very early on and uh, we would meet with librarians and just talk about what a book festival would look like. And so I will be, I will make a confession. I had, had never been to another book festival um, before. So I was, you know, imagining all of this on my own. I didn't know what a book festival was supposed mm -hmm. to look like. Um, which was probably the greatest thing, because if I had known what a book festival was supposed to be, then this one may have turned out very differently. Mm -hmm. um, I have since been to one other book festival, to the National Book Festival in Washington, oh, D.C. Nice. And um, what, but what we had discussed was, you know, book festivals tend to be authors get on a stage and they read their book and then they go sit down at a table and you buy the book. And they, you go up and they sign it. And I thought, what? what? Who wants that? I mean, I, no offense, like, I know. Yeah. I, I mean, it's great to listen to an author read a book, but I thought that is not the thing that's going to make somebody into a reader. And so, um, you know, going through the process of what we wanted it to look like, we knew we wanted that interaction to be a lot more meaningful um, than rather, you know, just having an author um, sort of just read on a stool or something mm -hmm. like that. So I thought we thought really big from the beginning and, but it was years. I mean, I'll tell you, it's like four years from when we decided to, to move forward to getting the first festival done. And it wasn't until we went to Susie Palmer, who was then the Dean of the library at Longwood University and presented it to her and said, um, you know, we want to do this. And I'd had some experience. I um, started a film festival in Athens um, after I got out of school in New York. And um, so I had some idea of what it took to put a big event together. Um, but so when I went to Susie, had been trying for years to get people interested and it was like, no, no, no. And so I get to Susie, she's like, yes. I said, what? Okay. You only said, need one, I yes. Said, I said, excuse Well, I didn't know that. I said, <laughs> I said, excuse me. And she said, yes. She said, we want this. And I said, okay, so who is the big yes now? You said yes. I've gotten you interested. Who's the next yes? And she said, oh, I'm it. And I was like, what? Okay. I don't have to go like all the way up the ladder to like everybody mm -hmm. on the board of visitors or something like that. She said, no. She said, I'm the yes. And that was maybe in what, like May? She said, can you have it ready by October? And I went, yeah. So it was a scramble. Um, but we did um, have our first book festival. I think it was 2014. I, I think that's the first year. I know that this year will be our eighth. Um, so I can't do There's a reason I run a book festival, not a math festival, people. I'm so sorry. Um, I can't, <laughs> I can't even. <laughs> But so whatever that first year was, mm -hmm. um, we had about 700 kids come that year over two days, which uh, I, I was amazing, um, more than I would have thought. But since then, um, I will say that by 2019, um, we had more than 16,000 kids come that's amazing. over three days. And that's really like pushing the limit of what we could have on campus. Um, but I would and but I would say that it only took about three years for us to get to the point where we were trying to figure out how to accommodate all the all the kids who wanted to come mm -hmm. and all the teachers who wanted to bring their kids. It really it became obvious super quickly that um, what we were doing was working and that we were filling a need and a want mm -hmm. um, for teachers and families in Virginia. It blew my mind. It really did. Yeah. Because I remember um, in 2019 attending some of the book events, and I was like, "Oh, this is amazing! Like, like authors are real people. They're right there." I was like, yes, calm down. I need you to take it down a couple notches. But like, like I'm a grown up. Yeah. And I had that experience, so yeah. I can you know imagine what it'd be like for an elementary school kid 
I know. Like, I mean, it's like they're rock stars, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, when Kazu Kabushi comes for Amulet and, you mm-hmm. know, it's just, it's like, oh my gosh. I mean, it's just, and for me, of course, in 2019, Katherine Patterson came, you know, and uh, I suppose everybody knows that she wrote Bridge to Terabithia and mm-hmm. Jacob Have I Loved and the great Gilly Hopkins and all of this. And I was just, I remember, I'm telling a story. So she came um and she grew up uh part of her life was spent here in virginia so she was sort of coming back home a little bit mm-hmm. and she arrived um during our keynote event uh which was held over at the new student center um mm-hmm. at longwood and so uh we had sent one of our really wonderful book festival volunteers to get her from the airport and drive her over and she had they were going through Amelia and she said oh I think her grandparents live there and she remembered oh, the cool. road you know like all this and so she gets to um Longwood and I'm standing there and I see um Brad Watson our wonderful friend volunteer coming in with Catherine Patterson and she comes up to me and I started crying I started crying and she yeah. looked at me she looked at me Leah and she went oh we're not doing that and I was like oh like oh but we got it we're like, not doing that and i was like don't you know and she, <laughs> she's like uh-uh she's like no way she's the best she was the best she's like you gotta settle down I'm I'm like, like, yeah, I, I gotta i, I gotta mean, settle it's, it's wild because i remember reading bridge of terabithia and just being like devastated like you hold the book and you're like no i know i didn't read that so then you go back and like re-traumatize yourself to just make sure what you thought happened actually happened. Then you like you throw the book, and then you just walk away. You come back and reread it. It's like the were you able to see? Were you able uh, to see her? Were you able to see her when she? I was wasn't. Oh, Leah, because what you I mean, like what you're saying, the whole book is based on an event that happened in her life. Oof. Her her son's best friend was killed by a random lightning strike at the beach when he was maybe in the sixth grade and it so she she says i mean she she took her a long time to realize how to process this Mm -hmm. process it and you know help her son through it and everything and she said that when she finished writing it she never wanted to read it again she's like i just don't she's like i don't but so now she talks about it all i'm like that's terrible you have to talk about it all the time but you know i I was like I, i said you know the fact that you could write something like that, that's mm-hmm. so powerful for so many people and so powerful for her even that she can't even go back and read herself. I was like, that is what a gift to be able to yeah. sit there and meet her and talk to her. I mean, and for these kids who have to, who have to read it in school. And then, you know, it's one of those books where you have to read it. And then, you know, that's one of those books where you realize you have to read it, but this book is everything. Yeah. And now there she is in front of you talking to you about it about and it. sitting down with you and talking to you about it. And I mean, it's just, I, it, what an experience. I wish that I were a kid and could come to the book festival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, oh, and you know, cause when you're growing up, you're learning how to process everything. Mm-hmm. So then like in that context of grief, it's like, how do you deal with grief? Well, here's, this is how they did it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that personal reflection and because you don't know you're reflecting when you're little for the most right. part. So it's like, I'm processing something, but I don't know what it is kind of thing. Yeah. So on the flip side of that, I'll say that Sophie Blackall, who's one of our um, longtime author illustrators, um, and she's won the Caldecott twice. She comes every year. She told me that this was several years ago, actually, that um, when she was taking questions after a session, this little girl raised her hand and said, I didn't know that girls could do this. Yeah. She said, she said, girl, you didn't know girls could, could do this. She said, no, I thought only boys could do this. And of course, Sophie, you know, was like, well, let me talk about this (laughs) for a little while, but (laughs) it's just amazing to me. You know, we had, um, I remember this also several years ago. This was several years ago. I don't know if anybody watching is familiar with French Hall um, on Longwood's campus, but it's a really beautiful building. Mm-hmm. And we were having a session in there. 
and Timothy Ehring was doing the presentation and he illustrated the tale of Despero. Mm. Um, he's just a wonderful uh, human being. He's, he's this big, he was a merchant Marine, you know, you wouldn't nice. think that he would be one of these sappy people like me or like Leah, but he really, <laughs> but he really is just incredibly kind. And, you know, I will say a sappy human being. I just love him to death. And so he was giving his presentation um, in French Hall. And after he was done, he saw this little girl in the corner crying. And he was just like, what has happened? And he went over to her because he's not going to buy cry alone. He's just not going to do it. And so he went over and the teacher had come over. This was a fourth grader um, from Amelia. Um, and it took her a second to get herself together. And finally, she was able to say, I've never been any place this beautiful before. And that blew my mind. Yeah. Um, that's another aspect of the book festival um, that has really, I didn't expect, but has really come to light for me. Um, and I will say that he took her immediately to our festival bookstore and said, get whatever you want, I'm paying for it. Like whatever you want, like, please just let me do this for you. <laughs> But I, so my, when I growing up, my father um, works at Hamden Sydney College. So I grew mm -hmm. up on a college campus essentially. And it never occurred to me that kids are intimidated by a college campus. It never occurred to me that they never Ooh, would have yeah. been on this before. Yeah. Cause they, but they, 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 just, they come to Longwood every year. Mm -hmm. And it's for most of them, um, especially when they're young, it's the first time and they get to come here and they see people who look like them. They get to, they learn not to be afraid of a college campus. Mm -hmm. um, they learn that it's a place where some of their happiest memories are made. And I will say that every year there are kids who are, who go to the admissions office during the book festival mm -hmm. and um, ask for an application, like right there. I mean, it just, it's blown my mind how that also has been an aspect of the book festival that was unexpected to me and just, I, I, unbelievable I just I can't believe it I'm so happy it makes me so happy yeah. and I wonder you know as we move on and the book festival happens over and over and over again how many of these kids are going to choose Longwood to mm -hmm. go to college how many of them are not going to be even if they don't choose Longwood are going to say hey I, I I've had so much fun on a college campus I'm not afraid this is a place for me I just I feel like that's just an, a wonderful aspect of of the book festival as well yeah I I never thought about the for intimidation on college campus because mm -hmm. like having gone to a couple of different schools, it's like, all right, it's school. It's what we do. Mm -hmm. But also my family are, are educators is what yeah. we do anyway. So yeah. it's like, that was the expectation. But if you're just not comfortable on a college campus, but then I remember freshman me, you know, deer in headlights, like what's, what's going on? What are we supposed <laughs> to do? Where are the classes? I have right. a schedule somewhere. And she's like, oh, so having students be able to come to Longwood mm -hmm. and actually be on campus and not just like toured through, but like spend time mm -hmm. in a particular building and a space and make, yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful. It is. And so many of our volunteers, it takes, you know, about 150 volunteers, you know, mm -hmm. to make it happen. And so many of those are students. And it's not just the students, it's the staff too that volunteer with us and also including the Moton staff. I mean, there are kids who have never heard the Moton story, mm -hmm. who now are more familiar with it and get to spend time, I mean, a whole lot of time there, you know, at the Moton and, and learn all about it. And it just, um, it's it, it's such a it's such a comfortable situation for these kids um, that I just um, I don't know what to say. I love it. I love the. Mm -hmm. Can I just say I love the book festival? I just love it. I love everything about it. It's just it's the most amazing thing. Yeah. Um, and I've also found I'm looking at your questions here because you had sent them to me and I'm just sort of skipping. Um, but what, I will say that another unexpected aspect of it was it's not just we sort of do a we do a survey every year after the book festival is over. We send it to teachers and initially, um, a lot of our questions were. You know, is there an interest in up, is there an uptick in reading interest afterwards, you know, library usage, all this sort of thing. But what the information we started to get was not just that kids wanted to read more, but they wanted to write and illustrate more. That every year mm -hmm. after the book festival, there would be illustration clubs or graphic novel clubs or, you know, chapter writing clubs. Like that's what kids wanted to do. They wanted to write their own books and illustrate their own books, which I, 
And I've seen, I've gotten so much information about that from people. I can't, I couldn't believe that either. And I just feel like even my own kids now are like, well, I want to be on that stage. I want to, I want to write that book. I can do it. And I was like, oh my gosh, what if, what if, what if 10 years, there's like this huge crop of kids who, who are writing because they're just like, I found out that I could do that too. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh. So I, it just makes me so happy. (laughs) And, you know, it's amazing because I obviously love books, love words, but being able to like build a story or build like a world or just tell a simple story in like a hundred words, it's, it's such a skill. And then to have kids be willing just to play, to play with words, it's to not be intimidated by it, to not be like, well, the sentence isn't right yet, but just keep working on it. You'll get there kind of thing. It's just that encouragement. It is. Um, and you know, when you grow up in a, in a, I don't know, I mean, it doesn't have to be a rural area. It could be who knows where, but I mean, you know, you look around at, mm-hmm. you know, the jobs and they're good jobs. It's not like they aren't, but you know, writers and, you know, books seem to come from somewhere else. For most people, books don't come from within their own community, mm-hmm. you know, so to realize that it's something that a person can really do. Um, I mean, that's, I'm so happy that the book festival offers that opportunity to these kids. I'd love to see every single one of them write books. (laughs) That'd be amazing. Yeah. I mean, because we all have our perspectives and like our family histories and our family stories and our personal stories. And there's value in that. So yes. Oh, yes. And imagination. Just you can use your imagination your whole life. You don't Mm -hmm. have to leave it behind just Mm -hmm. because you're growing up. You can have it your whole life. Mm-hmm. you know also so like you're us forget but <laughs> we can do it we can yeah and look you'll never be bored if you're all, always like well what about this storyline what about that yeah it, like it helps the day go by yes it sure does uh, and like going back to your comment about the student who didn't realize she could do mm-hmm. like she could she could be an artist she could illustrate she could do these things I saw this tweet I want to say it was from Angie Thomas and she was sharing with students and how funny oh what do you have yeah (laughs) yeah one of the students was like I didn't know black when authors exist and I'm like oh my god there's so many there's so many so then Angie Thomas like well here's Nick Stone here's like just listing off names I'm like yeah yeah read, read her stuff read her stuff read her stuff it's like yes this is this is a fact. You know, what's so funny is that for our hip hop and children's literature mm-hmm. program that we do at the Moten every year during the festival, we've never had a male author. Really? They've all, they've all been black women. Mm-hmm. Every one of them, every one of them has been a woman, which is really so. Yeah. If you see that tweet mm-hmm. again, you'd be like, look here, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let me tell you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, just to know it's a possibility is powerful. Yes. Like you have, like, th- this is an option. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh. I know we have so with Leah and I, we were, I know she's recording now. Of course, we had a big <laughs> chat before she started recording. And we were just chit chatting. And so um, I, I said, we could just do this all day. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of feel like we're sort of getting back to that already. <laughs> we're here like, all right. That's all right. So we're going to refocus. <laughs> That's right. Refocus. <laughs> Ooh, we're so, going to be talking about mascara next. Like we were. Well, we've done it. We've done it. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's let's talk about the elephant in the room. How did COVID impact the book festival? Well, as I said in 2019, when you got 16,000 kids here, that was not the case um, in 2020. Um, so I, w- I will say, so the one thing I do want to say bef- um, before going uh, forward anymore is that the book festival, the VCBF is more than the festival in October. Mm-hmm. We do lots of other things. That's like the big, huge fun thing that we do, but we do lots of other things throughout the year. Um, we do a lot of book distributions. Um, we distribute thousands, tens of thousands of free books every year. Um, we establish libraries at juvenile detention centers. We do book swaps. We, we, we do all kinds of things um, all through the year. So um, really in, it was in the spring. It's so funny. I went back and um, it was early March when we started pivoting to, uh, vir- to socially distance and virtual mm-hmm. um, options. 
Um, I've always been sort of an amateur virologist. I've, um, you know, I've always loved reading about, you know, the plague or um, Ebola or something like that. Um, so I knew, I'll tell you, I was like, mm-hmm, I've been waiting, like I've been waiting my whole life for this to happen. And oh. so I was like, I know what has to go down now. <laughs> so um, we uh, immediately started doing book distributions with um, school systems in our district um, when schools shut down um, and started providing food for kids. And we made sure that they had books to distribute as well. But we sort of had a test run with a Facebook Live Fest that we started um, in April. And so I was able to call on um, a real cadre of our um, authors who would be doing virtual programming um, every day or three times a week for about two and a half months, three months. And that was really successful. And this is just when authors were just starting to figure out even how to use, like, I remember the first ones were like, how does this work? How do, I'm like, I don't know how it works. We're gonna, so it was really early yeah. days. Um, so, of course, that was at the point where everybody was sort of hoping that things would change by the fall. So it was really sort of midsummer um, or early summer when I was like, you know what, I've got to, I've got to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Like I can't, you know, sit here because it takes the full year to plan the book festival. It's a big process to plan it and raise the money and do everything. And I, and I just thought, you know, we're going to have to figure out where our energy is going to go. Mm -hmm. And so it was pretty early um, when we decided that it would be all virtual for the fall. And I was glad that we had that time, um, that we did it fairly early. Uh, but so what, when we decided to do that, there was no way to really replicate the book festival experience itself. You just can't, number one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you come to the book festival, you're here all day, you know, for your whole school day, you're here. And you go from place to place. And so I, um, had sort of canvassed some teachers and things. And I said, what, I wanted to know what would work best for them. Um, and it became clear really quickly that, you know, running programming all day long, it was just not something that a teacher could dedicate herself to or mm -hmm. himself. I mean, it just, you just couldn't do that. I mean, you do have to teach class, um, ver whether you're online or in right. person, you, you know, you have to do that. So we figured that offering you know, one program every day at the same time would it would be the best thing to do. So we decided to make October Book Festival month. Mm -hmm. And so we had four weeks of programming and we broke it down by uh, genre, um, which actually really helped me to focus. Cause I'll tell you, I didn't know, and I bite my tongue cause not only do I not run a math festival but I used to say, used to say, I, I don't run technology festival. I run a book festival. And there I was biting my tongue because I, like, I had to figure this thing out. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard for me to sort of focus because what we do is so interactive normally. I, you know, I, it took a while for me to figure out that I just could not replicate that. I wanted to as much as possible, but there's just really no way to do that. Um, and so breaking the weeks down by genre, whether it's fantasy and sci-fi, um, picture book week, you know, hip hop um, week, you know, anything like that. It really, that helped me focus. And we, it also took some time to come up with the correct platform we wanted to use. Mm -hmm. Cause there's, I mean, there was an explosion of, you know, virtual options and um, I didn't want teachers to have to download anything new right. or have to learn a new skill because like, they're already learning Google Classroom and everything else that, you know, they'd already spent so much time with that. I was like, we just really need it to be easy. But we have to maintain the safety of the children and right. the authors and illustrators as well. And so that was a challenge. Um, but we were able to find a really good platform um, that I think the Moten uses now too, um, which is really great. And uh, so we were able to actually involve some kids in the programming. Um, we sort of, we, I guess we, we put it out there as sort of like a contest, mm -hmm. you know, would you like to be involved? Would you like to be on camera, you know, and have the opportunity to question or work with this author or that author or illustrator? And it worked out really, really well. And we didn't have um, any trouble at all uh, with it. Um, and I, f I, f I feel like it, it, it went really, really well. And we ended up having almost 30,000 kids 
um, register for the month. Wow. Yeah. And from all over the place. Uh, and I mean, when I say all over the place, I mean, from all over the world were registered to awesome. watch. Um, and I will say also, it did give us the opportunity to have some authors who may not have been able to come in person mm -hmm. um, were able to, I think specifically of Jeff Kinney, who writes um, the Diary of a Wimpy Kid books. And he's not always able to travel to book festivals and he does his own touring and things like that. But he was able to do this for us virtually, which I mean, That's it amazing. opened a lot of doors for us as far as outreach to kids from all over the country and then to just have some folks we'd always wanted but had not been able to get here physically. So there were a lot of upsides. Um, you know, of course we, we can't wait to be back in person but I think that moving forward it would be really hard to dial back our virtual right. offerings. I think that moving forward, we're going to have to have in-person and virtual. Mm -hmm. I, I, it really, it just, there was too much interest for us to not offer that anymore. I'm yeah. sure the Moton is going through the same thing. We talked to kids from Indiana the other week. So yeah, <laughs> it's been great. It's been great. Yes. yes. Um, and you're like, and in, in my personal context of, I love a lecture just the accessibility to everything because i'm not going to drive to williamsburg but i'll zoom i'll yeah. zoom in in a minute and we heard that from teachers too because we had for a long time and it's still something we hope to do in our long-term plan is have some satellite festivals around mm -hmm. um that's going to take a lot of a lot of work but you know there i'd heard from teachers in bristol who can't get here i mean they can't get here yeah. and they so grateful to be like oh my gosh now we can actually see what goes on and we can actually be a part of this so i know that we'd heard from a lot of teachers for whom this was the first time they were able to do something they'd always wanted to do so i'm that makes me super happy and i would never want to not let have them have that opportunity again you know so we're gonna always we'll have to find we'll have to find a way <laughs> to keep it going yeah it's it's definitely been like there is a silver lining in all the craziness. Yes. Just the accessibility has changed so much. It's true. It's Oof. true. And it's, you know, it's not just that it's, um, you know, with, we have always had our, um, our special needs programming at the book festival mm -hmm. as well, where we work with Longwood speech, hearing and learning services. Um, we're really lucky that Longwood has the capability to, um, offer us some space that may have the loops for um, kids who have the cochlear implants okay. or who are sensory sensitive. They have, we have all of that. Um, but this also gives us more of an, the virtual gives us more of an opportunity to provide, mm -hmm. um, you know, any sort of assistance anyone may need, um, whether, you um, you know, they are hard of hearing. Um, if we have something formatted um, in text, you know, to, to investigate, you know, sort of what that would look like for someone who has dyslexia and offer that as an option. Um, and also just being able to go back, you know, if you, you know, if you missed a day, or I know that a lot of times at the book festival, it's hard for people to choose at right. one hour what they want to go see. So just being able to offer an archive um, where people can go back and see that it does change what you're able to do for accessibility in a lot of good ways. Yeah, that's definitely something like I've been mindful of as of late and just in air presentations and how I talk super fast and I get really excited. So it's like slow down and like make space for students to tell me what they need to tell me kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. So that, I mean, just an archive is just, it's convenient, the convenient, the luxury of convenience and access. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's been tremendous. Yeah, it really is. It's great. I know I go back and access Moat and stuff all the time because I can't, there was one, y'all were doing something the other night and I was just in the middle of putting my kids to bed. I was like, darn it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can go oh, back yeah. and watch this. <laughs> I, um, I ended up watching an Alfred Cobb's his um, author's uh, author series, but about his book, and I'm like, okay, give me, give me all your personal story, your information. And he's a German professor. And I was like, so how did that work? How did that right. happen? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and just, cause I'm a, I like learning about people mm -hmm. and like, like 
what what he was going through and he's yeah. very open and honest in his conversation so it's like the luxury of time yeah and being able to actually take notes mm -hmm. from what his experience was when he was like out of schools because like we, that's the story we tell but then it's like what happens next yeah so many different options yeah so i definitely i've been i've enjoyed being able to go back and look at our stuff so i can incorporate it in in our car like like absolutely. here in this conversation absolutely Oof. okay yeah all right here's one uh oh throughout the years which author experience experience or experiences like stand out to you i know we talked about it some already well i can't tell tales too much um okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. um so let me think. Well, I will say this. I there were I remember distinctly the fir the first years that our authors did go to the Moton. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we would make sure to give them time to go up there and experience what the Moton is and uh, what a tremendous impact that has had on them. Um, I would say that my for author experiences. Yeah, we've talked about some. I think what I would say overall is that um what I've been blown away by is when authors come here and I'll tell you, I'm as much of a fan as anybody. And so I get really nervous and intimidated when authors come here. Um, so I remember when Mark Brown first came here, Mark Brown created Arthur, mm -hmm. so famous, the show, everything. And he said, this is the greatest book festival I've ever been to. And That's I was awesome. I rem I mean, and the reason he said that, and he's not the only one, Victoria Can, who writes Pink Alicia, says the same thing. You know, Catherine Patterson said the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like all these people, when they come, I guess the thing is that they they see what we're doing. Mm -hmm. They meet the kids, they want to be with the kids, and they get it. And so the fact that they get it and are continually supportive of us um blows my mind because we are in a very rural place um but i will tell you that here in farmville when these authors come they they are so welcomed and you know like they 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 love it here they always want to come back they love everything about it um but if i have to go to specific author experiences I would say that one of the great ones was having um, when Derek Barnes and Gordon C. James came for Crown Ode to a Fresh Cut, um, having the barber chair here and having Takeen Cooper get his hair cut on stage by a barber while they were discussing mm -hmm. their book. Um, that's a really great one. Um, you know, that was so fun. And then when Peter Brown came uh, for The Wild Robot and he got to work with 20 different robots and then all the kids got to go out nice. like, but yeah they got to do that i mean that's the thing about the book festival and when i say that we're interactive and all that i mean we try so hard to create these experiences that are really immersive for the kids so when we do a wild robot program we just don't have peter brown up there reading and talking about it we brought in 20 different robots of varying ability uh, with longwood's ittip department and the kids got to go out with peter with the robots on campus and see if they could you know complete any of the challenges the robot had to complete in the book and of course couldn't because it's a robot in a book that can do so much <laughs> but they got to go out there and do that and so you know, Derek and Gordon, it's not just they're talking about their book. Someone is actually getting their haircut in a barber chair by a real barber. A kid could have gotten their haircut too if their parents had allowed it, I'm sure. But you know, you know, down to our mural that we do every year with Monty, mm -hmm. um, where kids get to work and paint with an illustrator, and then we donate that mural, you know, whether it's to the children's hospital at VCU or you know, uh, Louisa County Elementary School or wherever it goes, um, whether it's just working, whether it's working with the LCBA and having just acres of newsprint, you know, mm -hmm. on the floor and on a table for kids to draw, you know, with you know every illustrator under the sun. Um, there's just I, I don't even know how to explain it, but you know, when they come here it's just it's like their family you know from the beginning and it's just so it's just so amazing but um i would say 
I mean, they could probably tell the stories better than I could, you know, but it's every year I see something new, you know, with an, with an author who comes and how they interact with a kid. Um, I will say, who was it? Was it Todd? It may have been Todd Parr who was telling me that he had seen this kid when he was going back to his school bus at the end of the day, just looked mad, so angry. And Todd couldn't figure, he was like, why is this kid so upset? And he went up and he said, what? He said, did you have a terrible time? What's, what's wrong? And he said, no, he said, I'm in the fifth grade and my school doesn't let sixth graders come in. So I'm not going to get to come back anymore. And Todd was like, oh my gosh, he was mad because he didn't think he yeah. would get to come back again. And I was like, wow, we are really, that's really something. But I can keep telling Catherine Patterson stories uh, 2019 at our book. And when we did have our book um, signing time, I will say that um, there was a really long, long line to get Catherine Patterson mm -hmm. to sign books. And there was this girl in line. She was with her parents and she had a cane. And she and her family had come all the way from England to see oh. Catherine Patterson. And she was blind. This little girl was blind. And her copy of Bridge to Terabithia was in Braille. And it was about this thick. Mm -hmm. And Catherine Patterson said she had never seen a copy of the book in Braille before. And that was really, that was really amazing. That was very, that, that was something, that was something yeah. to see right there. It really, really was. I couldn't believe anybody had come that far, number one. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, it was just, I mean, that must have been a lifelong dream. I know that we had a family come up from Florida to see Twee Sutherland, who writes the, um, Wings of Fire series. They brought their daughter up for a birthday, you nice. know, just stuff like that. I mean, I can't, it's just really, it just makes me, everything makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> I just you know, ran on for about an hour. I'm sorry, Leah. No, this is, this is exactly what I wanted because I want people to know like, this is what the books festival does along with the events outside of the actual festival. Cause it's, right. it's always a good time to read. It's always a great opportunity to read. If you're trapped in the car, take a book with you. I, I was trapped. Yeah, it's. I learned the hard way. I was driving to work once, and the bridge was open for 30 oh. minutes. No book in the car. I'm just like sad sitting. So oh, I keep. Yeah. I keep one on me. I keep a book with me. Just there you go. Keep it on you. <laughs> yeah, and it's a tangible experience with a book is amazing. Like when you were speaking about with the robotics. I, I enjoy fantasy and sci-fi. So it's like, how, how would that work? It wouldn't in the real world, but in this book, it does. Right. But being able to fiddle with something, mm -hmm. like to have like that robot experience of, okay, can we make this do this? Well, what if you do it this way? What if we do it that way? The different types of thinking that's happening in that one case scenario is amazing. Because yeah. you know, I always hear books are boring. No, 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 no. You haven't found the one you like yet. It's fine. Right. Right. That's what we always say. The right book in the right hands mm -hmm. of the right kid at the right time. That's a lot of mm -hmm. rights, but boy, can it change. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yes. And I love that graphic novels are involved. And because if you don't, as long as you're reading something, I'm happy. That's how yeah. I feel about it. Well, a lot of people, um, you know, they'll dismiss graphic novels. And I do feel like you need a good balance of graphic novels and mm -hmm. chapter books. I, I believe that. But I will say that, you know, like comics before them, graphic novels challenge a kid's brain mm -hmm. to jump from one panel to the next and fill in what happens in between. Mm -hmm. And that is really, that's, that's, a, that's really important. You know, I mean, that's, that is something that, um, I think should be developed in children. It encourages their imagination. It makes them anticipate and learn things. Um, I think that that's, I, I, graphic novels are great for that. And that's really something you, cause kids, you know, brains need to make that jump. They need to make that jump in real life as they grow up. If, if this happens now, what happens then? I mean, it just really, it really helps. It really helps with that. I mean, I wouldn't dismiss graphic novels, although a nice balance. <laughs> it can't all be dog man. Sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, Dave Philby. Um, it can't all be dog man. But um, you know, no. I mean, I love graphic novels. I think they're fantastic. From like a historian perspective, you know, Moton Civil Rights Museum. Um, John, well, John Lewis's graphic novel March. Mm -hmm. So. I read the first one, it was a, it's a library here. And then I got the second two and the librarian was like, hey, so here's a warning. 
it gets real. I'm like, okay, so they tell what actually happened because the civil rights movement was horrifying for many different reasons. But to have this, this tool, like for me, it's a tool to teach this story and tell this story. And then like, like John Lewis, like he's, he's a real person and, you know, the fangirl for me. Yeah. But then, you know, to have this, this story and in the context of a graphic novel, so it's like a degree of separation, but also, so it's accessible without being overwhelming. Well, I'll tell you, that's in our long-term plan too, Leah, is to set up, you know, the book festival wants to set up some sort of um, fellowship mm -hmm. to have a graphic novelist to come spend time at the Moton for like six months or however long it takes and do a Barbara Johns graphic novel. That's like our- That'd that, be amazing. That's yeah. our big dream. So we'll have to keep talking about that. Because <laughs> that's our big dream. I'll make a note. <laughs> Because I mean, she's in the SOLs now. She, you know, she's in the Statue Hall um, in the Capitol. I know. So it. the Moton story is like it's getting out there, and it's super exciting for us. But then when their students come through, it's been I miss them being here. Yeah. yeah. It's like there's noise in the museum. A child is here. We had a homeschool group just come visit. Uh -huh. It's like, hey guys, I'm so happy you're here. I'm just really happy you're here to see you. How can I help? Like what? <laughs> Do you want to tour? Like, what do you want to do? Because it's just with COVID. Yeah. It's like, I miss tiny, like tiny humans oh, yeah. and their questions. Cause they, I love when children ask questions like, wait a minute, hold on. I need to clarify this. I'm like, okay, you're, you're on the right page. It doesn't make sense. This is why they did it. This is why this yeah. happened. Yeah. You know, in telling these, it's not a hard history. It's just uncomfortable history. Yeah. And, and like, I mean, and, so, yeah. and, and in so many ways, it's a history that kids can't co even comprehend. Yes. You know, I mean, yes. that's, I feel like, and that's good. I mean, it's, we don't want them to ever have to mm -hmm. be able to comprehend it in that way to be like, oh yeah, that's an experience I can recognize. Like we don't, we don't want no, that, we don't want that. No. Feel that way, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, just the reality of it, you know, making them realize it was a reality. It's, it's hard. It's definitely hard to get that across. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things that are like that, but I mean, for heaven's sakes, I mean, if a, a kid, like my kids are like, did you have TV when you were a little mom? I'm like, oh my God, like you can't even, how are you? <laughs> like, no, hey. we didn't. No. We just went outside. It's fine. We read by the coal oil light. There you go. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that is hilarious. <laughs> So your challenge is <laughs> <you're> very hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure I, I asked those kind of questions when I was a wee lamb as well. So, oh, yeah. So oh, what yeah. was your life like? And they're like, okay, buddy, calm down. Go go play. Go outside. Yes, I could wear pants as a child. I didn't <laughs> wear a petticoat. That, that, is, that's a wild, that has been a wild question because like my grandmother made clothes and I was like, so how'd you do it? How'd you make what you didn't go you didn't go to the store she was like no <laughs> we, no we made it at no oh my and God. like i think she made me a dress and it has like nice smocking and it's a whole big like operation yeah. for this okay. one garment i'm like i can't play outside in this i know <laughs> <laughs> like look i but, know yeah. it's the truth oh, <laughs> okay. okay okay all right back to focus sorry everybody if you were with us though it would be the same it really would it really would it's just great it's just great <laughs> okay is there an author you haven't met yet you want to meet well you asked that right after beverly cleary dies so i mean that's uh so what what Ooh. happened was i saw it on twitter and i was like does what i need to know so then i went to go like the bcbs facebook and i was like okay Okay, so okay. So then it was like, now I'm just gonna sit here quietly because I don't know what else to do. I know. No, that was a that was a heartbreaker because I had, I mean, I mean, there's no real way I could have gotten somebody who was 104 and lived yeah. in Oregon here. But the dream was there, mm -hmm. you know, like I could have, should have. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are lots of authors that I would love to have with us. Um she, of course, being such a titan and such a legend would have been amazing. I will say that in the first year of the book festival, Judy Bloom Skyped 
but I would love to have her in person. I mean, mm -hmm. I would love to, I would love to have someone as formative as Judy Bloom here. Um, but there are just so many. Um, I wanted John Lewis. I wanted John Lewis. And I thought that that was going to be able to happen for a while. And then it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I was really hoping. Um, oh, golly. Um, I mean, I can't, you can't ask me that kind of question. I get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, that's I'm fair. Trouble. I'm like, in trouble. That, I want everybody who's already come to come and then everybody who hasn't. There you come go. To, that's what there I, you go. Do. I want that. But no, <laughs> I would have, I would have said that, you know, Judy Bloom I mean, and uh, Beverly Cleary would have be too that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for me, just for me as a reader of my own self, you know, as a child, it would have been incredible to, um, and of course, Judy Bloom, if you're watching or listening, <laughs> Um, from Florida, you are more than welcome when you feel comfortable to come up here and we'll take good care of you. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that was, it was, a Beverly Cleary for sure. She would yeah. have been, she would have been one. I'm so grateful that, um, Catherine Patterson has been able to come and she plans on coming again. So oh, good. I hope that that, I hope that that will happen, but yeah, definitely like that. <laughs> okay. So how the big has, question is who do you want to come? See, that's the that's the thing. See, it's like who would you want to come? All right. I fangirl. We know this. This is a fact. I want to see Jacqueline Woodson. I know she's she been came. here before. Yeah, but I, I was Okay. <laughs> we gotta get our timelines right. Okay, right. Cause then in everything she's written, I've I've pretty much read. I think I requested Feather from the library. Yep last week so yeah okay. i'm like i'm slowly getting all of her, her books in because i remember being in middle school and reading if you come softly and it's so beautiful but i was not ready yeah so then i'm just like holding like oh like all that all the emotion yeah in a middle school body yeah, it's yeah. Like, i'm just gonna go outside and walk i just need to go yeah. detox from this and then like the sequel Time moved on and I finally, I read the sequel and I was like, okay, I feel a little better. It's still bad, but I feel a little better right. about it. Yeah. Cause you know, it's just, the words are just so beautifully written. Mm -hmm. I'll then, try to get her back on down here. I know she just, um, she's like the writer in residence at the Kennedy Center now, I think. So she might be tied up, but I will, I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, gosh. And then because I read a lot of like, like young adult, because it's like, this is a light read. This is, right. it's not a light read. It's just no. written for high schoolers. Yeah. And it's like, I can just jump in and jump out of this. So when I'm detoxing from his reading history and all that trauma, you just pick something else. Um, Nicola Yoon, I'm in love with her. Very good. Yes. Very good. Yes. I'm very excited for her book come out in June, like my birthday. So I was like, mom, I have a birthday in June. This book is out in June. Maybe these things can come together. There I'm just go. saying. I'm just saying. I'll work on it. So this is what I do. I mean, I'll tell you, this is what I do. If I'm walking and I see a kid reading, I, I mean, I'm, I'll am i be like, what are you reading? Do mm -hmm. you like it? Do you like mm -hmm. it? I mean, like, that's how, that's a question I get a whole bunch. Like, how do you choose authors? I'm like, well, number one, I look around and what kids are reading. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like, that's, that's what I do. I take, we take recommendations from our authors who have come because they know what kind of person would fit with us. Yeah. And then I look at what kids are reading and I'm just like, that's, I mean, what better way to do it than see who kids want to come here. Oh yeah. Cause like my, my eldest niece, so she's nine and she's in a graphic novel that I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. Let me see what I can do. So I already have like a list of five in my, um, in my cart for, for her birthday. Like, so she'll, she, she is live? set. Where so she live? she's, she's in Carolina right now. Well, we get people from Carolina all the time. Mm -hmm. she, mm -hmm. you, you find out who she wants and we'll get them here and then she can come yeah. on up and visit. Yeah. There you go. Cause it's like, like, I just want you to read something. Just yeah. anything. Yeah. And so how it was described, she got the book, she devoured the book and then she just sat there and I'm like, oh yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. You just like, you can't put it down. You're fully engulfed in this story. And like, to me, that's why books are so powerful. Different worlds, different spaces, their escape. They're also yeah. like hope yes. in some way. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So here's like a really simple question with like a booing answer. Uh-huh. How has VCBF changed your life? I'm busy. I'm real busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Oh gosh. Um, well, I would say if you want like a big, huge, you know, mm-hmm. TED talk kind of answer, then what I would say is that it's one of those things where a little girl with an idea Mm -hmm. who's determined can, you know, make a change, but it's, um, what's it's, mm, it's made me, um, well, I mean, you know, if I'm honest, I mean, it certainly is open. I mean, I met people I never would have met, you know, otherwise that's for sure. Um, it's opened my eyes to a lot of issues that I didn't know about. Um, and I just feel like it gives me purpose and strength, you know, because it is a really hard work. It's really hard work to do it. It's really hard to raise the money to do it. Um, cause while I'll say this, everything we do is free to everybody, mm-hmm. but it's not free to us. <laughs> um, but every year when we have the book festival and I go and I see those miles of kids getting off the school bus, I just think I'm, I'm doing something right because Mm -hmm. you can, you know, I mean, like sometimes, you know, you get so caught up in how hard something might be, or, you know, you might feel defeated because maybe that author you wanted can't come, or maybe, you know, there's a book that, you know, you really believe in that some, there's some controversy about like, maybe it's banned, but it's really important. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. like all there's, you know, maybe this donor said, no, you know, maybe all these things can happen, but I'm telling you, you know, on those days when you see those kids with those authors and you see how excited they are Mm -hmm. and how happy they are to be there, it's overwhelming. I mean, it just, and it makes, it makes me, um, we have such a good team now working volunteers you know to make these things happen and to see how you know what it's taught me this is something because um it's taught me that you don't have to dream alone Mm -hmm. that there are people around you if if you if you believe in it and and you give it everything that you have other people will join you and that's been a huge surprise to me because there are people who work with us that believe in it as much as I do. And I never, I didn't never knew that that could be possible, but I, I mean, it's just, it's amazing to me. You don't have to dream by yourself. You don't have yeah. to. And I want every kid to know that too. You don't have mm-hmm. to. Same was true for Barbara John. She didn't have to dream by herself. She didn't have to, you know, she probably felt like it a whole bunch, but at the end of the day, yeah. she didn't have to. Yeah. Cause yeah. Isn't that awful? What a terrible, like, sentimental thing for me to say. Sorry. Well, well, I also put my hair in ponytail. Y'all, I tried to keep it down, but it's bothering me. <laughs> I mean, but it's important to know we don't have to be alone. Yeah. And, like, and hyper-individualism is toxic for many yeah. reasons. Yeah. But, yeah, even with Barbara Johns, she, there was a strike committee. She wouldn't, buy, like, completely by herself. She, like, she had this idea, this thought, and then she asked different students, like, hey, I need your help. And, you know, John Stokes, he shared in one or on history. He was like, nope, mm -mm, not me. No, for a long time. So yeah, you don't have to go at it alone, whatever it is. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our viewers? Oh, golly. Um, I, well, I don't know. I would say that if your kids need books, you can certainly ask us and we'll try to get them books. You know, if you're, if, if your students have too many books, there's no such thing as too many books, but if they, you know, or if their parents are cleaning out the bookshelves, we'll take your books and put them in the mm-hmm. hands of kids. And all I can say is that, you know, if you've never come to the book festival, we certainly want you to come and, and give it a try, especially if we can come back in person at all. Mm-hmm. Um, we will one day, of course, be able to. But um, it's just a, you know, we're a resource for teachers, for parents, 
Um, we have all sorts of, you know, digital programming now that we do. We have our Ready, Set, Diversify about diversifying your kid's bookshelf. Mm -hmm. um, we're just this afternoon at one o'clock, we're starting our Hip Hop is Poetry Week programming since it's National Poetry Month. So we'll be talking about using hip hop in the classroom. Um, we have our children's book rap challenge tomorrow, uh, nice. which is going to be so fun. <laughs> um, but I mean, I would say um, just check us out and we're, we're, um, I mean, I don't know, I guess a lot of people probably haven't heard of us. I'm not very good at marketing, um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I would just say that, yeah, keep a book in the car, keep a, keep a book in a bag, keep a book <laughs> wherever, um, and that it's never too late to um, get a child interested in reading. It really isn't. Um, and keep reading aloud to your kids. Do it all the way through high school. I'm telling you, just do it, please. If there's one thing I can say, just keep reading aloud to your children. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's gonna go a long way in helping them um, become lifelong readers, it really is. And go to the Moton. Go to the Moton. Yes, yeah. Go to the Moton. <laughs> and we might see you there because we're always there anyway yes. <laughs> when we're allowed to be. <laughs> so come to the Moton. So I don't know, Lee, I just appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Thanks so much. And look, I need to look, I've talked so much and I don't have my color on anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we want to thank you for your time and then all that you do for the community and then like for the Commonwealth and then for the world, because we know these to be up going virtual. Huge yeah. audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh well thank you so much i got to get ready for this hip-hop is poetry today yes. um so I'll, I'll get a quick turnaround but anyway leah it's always so nice to see you even if it's on a screen absolutely and thank you again all right leah thank you so much bye everybody bye.